Barbie, where do you think addressing our homelessness crisis ranks among the top priorities of most politicians in office today? I feel like it's pretty low. Economically, it's going to strain everyone. When we think of the homelessness crisis, we think of one group of people. We're leaving out the huge group of people in the working and middle classes that are one paycheck away from devastation. Definitely. You know, six months of treatment and it was $4 million wow. in medical bills. This is how fast life changes. It's like I can sit around and kind of complain about it or I can be willing to do something about it. So I decided to run for U.S. Congress and here I am. There's other people that they collapse under something like this. And often this story ends with people living on the streets. Barbie, do you think the area's homeless crisis is a local issue, state issue, or a federal issue? All of the above. We spend most of our money hiding the homeless rather than helping them. Right. But what would happen is in, instead of investing in hiding a problem, we invested in the people. Because to me, it's, it's not throwing money away. It's investing in the people that will then turn around and invest right back into their communities. We need to make sure that the money that we're putting out there is actually going to help the situations that it's being put towards and not just the appearance of it. Hi everyone, I'm Tracy Lewis with We Are Winter Garden and we are joined today with Scott Ballou who is the founder and CEO of Matthew's Hope as well as Barbie. Hardin Hall, who is currently running for the U.S. House to represent Florida's 11th Congressional District. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Welcome to episode 54 of Straight Talk, No BS with Matthews Hope, where we're going to be talking uh, with Barbie about the intersection of homelessness and politics. So Barbie, thank you for joining us again. For those who may not be familiar, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So my name is Barbie. I am a wife. I'm a mother. We own a small business out in Mount Dora where we live. And running for politics is not something I ever really imagined. I always had an in interest in politics and American history and things like that. But three years ago, my son, my one-year-old son, had just suddenly stopped walking one day. He was happy, healthy. We went on this diagnostic journey only to find out a few months later that he had a fatal rare genetic condition wow. and quickly had to <laughs> switch gears. I had just had our fourth baby um, and had to go to Pennsylvania to have a cord blood stem cell tra transplant. I mean, we went from, you know, dealing with COVID and dealing with all of these things, but looking back on it was just, you know, so small compared to, you know, having a five-year mm -hmm. life expectancy. And unfortunately, he would pass away after about six months from complications from the cord blood transplant. And coming back home and being in that grief stage and trying to figure out what to do with my time. And I started advocating for the 30 million Americans who live with a rare disease. And through that, seeing a lot of the red tape uh, in our federal bureaucracy and seeing a lot of the roadblocks that we have at the federal level. And unfortunately, it, we're, we weren't getting anything done at Congress. It, we were focusing too much on political games instead of the things that were actually affecting people's lives. And I saw how it was affecting other children's and families where health insurance companies were denying treatment because they were saying that the child wasn't sick enough, but they had a fatal diagnosis. Wow. So I was like, I can sit around and kind of complain about it, or I can be willing to do something about it. So I decided to run for U.S. Congress, and here I am. Wow, that is very... I do like I said, I just decided to run for U.S. Congress. <laughs> I know, I'm just, I'm just like in awe right now. I'm like, wow. You know, and Barbie, I, I did not know this part of your story, and I think that it's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that, and I'm sorry, obviously, for your loss, but I, can, I can't even imagine, uh, but just can't even get my head around that. But you, as you said, you could, you could sit around and, and grieve, which I sure, sure you still have days that of do course, that. Yeah. Um, but to turn that grief into service is, is huge. Yeah. I mean, so I think you. even your own story that you said, there's advocating and then there's doing it in a different way and where you're best able to serve. And you know, you're doing an amazing job with Matthew's Hope and I'm hoping to just do it in a different perspective and really give a voice to, I feel like in our federal government, we have a lot of people from one background 
And then a lot of voices that have experience with working class, middle class issues that get lost in the mix Mm -hmm. or are not accurately represented. And so I feel like even though my situation is one thing that not everybody's going to experience, I am running and know what it's like to come to your representative and say, I need help. Mm -hmm. And what takes a person to get to that point Mm -hmm. and being able to give them the time and the respect and the consideration, no matter what the issue is, no matter what I agree, if I agree with it or not, as a representative, you're supposed to be there and hear those people that come to you. And I know what it takes to get to that point. So I feel like that's where I can connect with people. Mm -hmm, Definitely. Are you familiar with Matthew's Hope and what they do? I am. I think it's absolutely incredible what you all are doing. And unfortunately, I'm sure it's getting a little bit harder as things get worse uh, locally, but you're still continuing to do the work and it's amazing. We appreciate that. I, I think that, um, you know, just to touch on now knowing more of, of, of Barbie's personal story is I think the listeners out there need to understand that how uh, how fortunate it is for her um, that that she was able to make it through this. Um, I don't know if you ever become whole again, mm. but 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 be able to to continue on with life differently where a lot of people that have had to go through the same thing, either we're all built different. Sure. Okay. Obviously Barbie's built with a, a certain strength in her. Um, and, and there's other people that they collapse under something like this. And I think it's, it's uh, from a mentally mental health standpoint, it's, I'm sure you could share it becomes so overwhelming, but then you have your finances, you have the other children to worry about, you have your spouse, you have all these other things. How are we going to pay the bills? How are we going to do all these things? Mm-hmm. And often this story ends with people living on the streets. Mm-hmm. And it started out with something that, hey, everything's happy, healthy. We're going. The fourth child's on the way. And suddenly my one-year-old uh, goes from b- bouncing around the house to all of a sudden not walking. Uh, this is how fast life changes. And I think often the general public fails to remember that. So I ask each of you that if you've been through something, consider that as you're, whether it's homelessness or, or any other type of thing that we play into here, you got to consider that, that everybody has a battle they're fighting. It just looks different than the battle you're in. Absolutely. So. Barbie, we were talking before we started um, the podcast and you grew up in Florida so when were you familiar with the homelessness crisis here? Was it way back when? Was it recently? Yeah, I was born and raised right here in Florida in Lake County. And I would say, you know, Lake County and some of these even Winter Garden has built up so much that it used to be a issue that you saw when you went to maybe downtown Orlando or the big city. And it wasn't a huge concern. I mean, I I feel like I know that growing up in in my church, there were people that were less well off. And my grandfather was an amazing inspiration to me. He was, you know, able, he grew up on a farm in middle of nowhere, Alabama, really struggled. You know, his family was not, you know, struggled financially for so long so that he was a huge saver. He wore like the same outfit, like a week in a row, but he was able to get money, a personal wealth for himself, but he was always helping other people. And he was always, you know, where he was needed. And he helped so many people in the community. And it, it really showed me that there's things that we can do that's not outwardly recognized, but that used to go such a long way. But now it's like, we can't even tap into all the people that need help Mm. by ourselves. Do you think people here in the area are aware of the crisis that's happening around them? I feel like we're getting more aware of it. I think that for so long and, and, and still in people's minds, it's somebody is homeless because of their own faults, because they're not willing to do the work or they're not willing to help themselves out or whatever the excuse may be. But as we're seeing, and even myself, you know, things are getting a little bit tighter. Finances are getting, you know, money is not going as far as it used to. We're all kind of struggling a little bit so that I'm hoping that people are seeing that 
sometimes people want, they want to work, they want to be out. They don't want to be in the situation that they're in, but unfortunately circumstances in life has caused this to happen. So I, I think that I'm hoping people recognize it. And I, I think we're all kind of seeing it, that we're seeing more people out on the streets and what can we do about it? Well, I think also, you know, it, Lake County, Orange County, yeah. especially West Orange County used to very much be a rural area. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of these people that were here, but they were very deep in the woods and no one was paying attention. And so due to development, and I'm not saying you can't stop development. It's going to happen. You can mm -hmm. control what it looks like if you try, if you try. Um, <laughs> but you, you can't, you're not going to control the actual development itself. People are coming until we quit having babies and things like that. We're, we're going to grow. Uh, but what's happening is, is every time I used to say, when you see some woods and you hear about a black bear, we always hear about those on the news or a fox mm -hmm. or some, or even a bobcat, give it a few more minutes and you're going to see a homeless man, woman, or child come out because that's, that was home for them. Mm -hmm. And so with development, uh, and it's, and it's moving that way into Lake County now, it just keeps coming out. It's almost like this seeping water it has to go someplace. So it's he heading out to Lake County now. And, and people are becoming more aware, I think. I don't know that they're aware of the crisis, but they're becoming more aware of homeless people. Mm -hmm. Barbie, do you think the area's homeless crisis is a local issue, state issue, or a federal issue? All of the above. I, I think that we are seeing it so much more here in Florida than other places. But it's it's across the, the country. Mm -hmm. But I, I really feel like we have it on such a higher level here in Florida because of our housing crisis that we're having, because of the unaffordability crisis that I think Flor Floridians are seeing at a little bit higher of a level than the nation as a whole. But uh, yeah, I think it's an issue that we have to tackle on every single level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll just share, you know, I know that we, ask uh, Congressman Webster that same question, and he feels it's a local issue. Um, can you tell us why you feel differently about that, uh, um, being that it's, you feel it's more of a federal, state, and, and local issue? Yeah, I mean, I, I did see that comment and that it's not really something that he was concerned about. And, and to me, it's we have to be concerned about. We have the, uh, we have HUD, um, Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Biden administration, their 2025 budget accounts for 72.6 billion in funding for affordable housing to tackle the homelessness crisis. But they also want to do a huge investment over 10 years of $185 billion to invest in affordable housing and to tackle some of these issues. And I, I think so the federal government is is pushing funds into these into our homes, into our states, into our communities. But the most immediate way to do it, because it's going to vary from place to place, mm -hmm. is the state and local governments. Mm -hmm. So we do have to work together to do this because they don't the federal government doesn't send funds to specific people. They send it to communities. They send it to the state. And then we have to just have all the stakeholders make sure that it's going to the places that it needs and it's addressing what it has to address. But I think here in Florida, we're seeing issues where it's making the situation worse by criminalizing people mm. for the situation they're already in. Which we are going to talk about that. Well, and, sit, and I'm, I'm what, you know, I, I, you know, I'm a high school dropout. Let's just get that out of the way. Okay. So I'm, I'm kind of the dumbest guy at the table, but I figure out some things along the way. Um, a lot of folks don't really understand how our government operates. So it's not like the feds are going to come sweeping in, build houses. What they're going to do is they're going to, based on information request, okay. And how that money, it's going to come to the state. And then the state's going in from there. A lot of it will come in state county wise. So it really does require a for these separate pieces of government to cooperate and to uh, to interact with one another, mm -hmm. which for it's whatever reason, words. we've really gotten away from. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that's it, it really is an issue that that has to, in my opinion, that has to come at all levels. Uh, and then it's going to take private and public coming together because the truth is the government 
is not the expert in these areas. Okay, they can make the resources available. Um, you know, we ourselves are not government funded. We we did our first grant through the count Orange County this past year. Um, in, four, in 15 years is the only time we've ever done it. And I will tell you that it's been a challenge. One is because there's so much that's required to get it, to get approved for it, and then to actually get the money back. Mm -hmm. And an organization like Matthews Hope can't be the bank right. for, for, for the county. Um, and, and we've had to do that a little bit. But but on top of that, it's, it's uh, a lot of that money from HUD was arranged now to and if you know something different than I do, I, I had learned this past year that to help identify the homeless and what their specific areas of need were. In other words, the type of homeless, if they were, um, so that we could put them down a tube, if you will. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm saying this person has a mental disability. So we need to use funding to get them down that path. This person's a veteran. We have to do this and, and so on and so forth. There was more money almost set aside, as I understand it, to rec to, to, to determine the problem than there was actually addressing the problem. I mean, I think that we all know that when it comes to any type of bureaucracy, government agency, there's too much red tape. There's sometimes regulations are good, but then sometimes those rules and regulations get in the way of the help. So I definitely think that's something that has to be addressed. Um, but unfortunately, I also feel like we're in a fight to even keep that funding, to yeah. even have the ability to address it. And, you know, when I read something like the, the Project 2025 agenda or with some of these people that are coming out and saying they want to completely dismantle HUD and they want to privatize it and put it in the hands of developers and investors. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to me, that's not the right solution. And instead of working together and instead of coming up with problems that affect everybody, no matter what your party is, no matter what you believe in, um, it's, we're ignoring it and we're kind of going off on these tangents. But yeah, I mean, let's say the bureaucracy and federal agencies are not perfect. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, and maybe you know better than I do, there are some situations where it's not going to fit somebody with a mental health issue. It's not mm -hmm. going to fit somebody who has served our military, you know, served our country yeah. in the military and has their own, um, you know, things to deal with and, and needs. But then we also hear that seniors, homelessness in seniors is on the rise and makes up a third of the homeless here in, in Florida. And that's a completely different issue. So yeah. It, yeah. It, we definitely have to service different groups in different ways, but we have to make sure we're doing it. You know, we're not spending all the money on mm -hmm. research and not doing anything to back it up. But yeah, I, I look at, at, you know, I think when I hear one more study, I'm thinking of what right. I could do with that money. <laughs> uh, you, you, you touched on, on seniors, our, our fastest growing yeah. population right now, uh, again, our seniors and the bulk of them have pensions and social security. Um, but those, that, that pension and that social security wasn't designed for today's economy. Right. Number one, number two, if they lose a spouse, then it's a cut. And it really, quite honestly, it doesn't cost you that much more to have another person in your house. Okay, the house payment stayed the same. So we're seeing we had a woman in Brevard come in a few weeks ago, 85 years old on a mm -hmm. on a walker, first time homeless in her life. She had no family to go to. Her health was declining because she couldn't lay down. Her her ankles were as big as my thighs. And and it's all because of poor circulation and her inability to lay down. We were supposed to lay down a, a half, a, almost half of our life uh, to get, make everything work properly. And so we're seeing that. And in the second fastest population we're seeing is those with physical and mental disabilities. And I'm not even touching on mental illness yet. I'm talking about they were born with a disability, right. <clears throat> a cognitive issue, a physical issue where they cannot care for themselves and they're outliving their caregivers by years, you know, it used to be a lot of folks with disabilities. They didn't live past their thirties. Mm -hmm. 
And now they're living to be 60, 70, 80 years old, but their caregiver guy died 20, 30 years ago. Mm. And that $709 uh, uh, check they get for being disabled. Yeah, not uh, cutting it. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Barbie, where do you think addressing our homelessness crisis ranks among the top priorities of most politicians in office today? Um, I feel like it's pretty low. Because, unfortunately, those are not the people that are going to be making contributions. Mm -hmm. They are not the people that are going to be able to get out and vote, especially when you're dealing with voter ID laws, where if they don't have a stable house, uh, they don't have an ID to be able to go vote. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it's not it's not high on the list. And unfortunately, it's more on the other way where it's you know, we, they look at it as kind of like a blight on the area. They look at it as not a problem to be solved and fixed for those people, but for the others that are like, look what this is doing to our community and our home values and things like that. But we're ignoring the ways that we can try and fix it. Maria. And I, and I, I just say, I don't think any of us sitting here uh, for a minute think that, uh, it's okay for people to sleep in a yard or in a public park or whatever that that's nobody is saying that what we're talking about is uh, uh, there's got to be more to it than that. Uh, I mean, I certainly, I don't want to see my property values go down. Who does? Right. That's, that's our greatest opportunity to gain any kind of wealth at all is our homes at, at the same time, not here doesn't seem to solve the problem. And, um, you know, I, so I want to make sure people understand that, that when they hear us talking about that, we're not saying, oh, just let people do whatever right, they want to do. Right, right. But I do also, in touching on some of what you said, constitutionally, uh, the, the, we're, we've trampled all over Amendment 8. We've trampled all over that. Uh, we're trampling other, you know, the right to vote does not have anything to do with owning property. That is in our Constitution. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we're trying to make that a, a change in that and saying, well, you don't have rights unless you've invested, had the ability to invest in the economy. Right. Uh, you, can you imagine if our forefathers had to do that? Um, you know, it, that, that if, you, if you go back in history and think about how this country has been built and what's made it great, and you took all those opportunities away. Now, a lot of times they didn't exist, and that's why we put them into existence. Mm -hmm. Now we're trying to take them away. Can you can you just imagine what it might look like then? Mm -hmm. How many more people we'd be talking about and dealing with right now? Mm -hmm. I went. To, I participated in a candidate forum, and they asked the voter ID. Do you support you know the voter ID? requirements and things like that. And everybody was like, yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Protect our, you know, and I, and I was the only one to say, I, we, I, we want the most secure elections that happen. We don't want people who are not supposed to vote to vote or anything like that. We want secure elections, but we also have to think about the people that are being limited or eliminated from having mm. the ability to vote simply from their circumstances or their situation, whether it's they don't have a home at all or they don't have a stable one. So to me, it's something that a lot of people ignore. And it, it can't be because, mm -hmm. in my opinion, being able to vote is your right as a citizen. And everybody should have that ability, but we should also make sure that elections are secure. But I just feel like it's an issue that's not being touched on. Mm -hmm. It seems like we have a tendency through most things in our country to swing very far one way to the other constantly rather than sitting there going, okay, what makes sense here? Right. I, I, again, I want to say this because I always tell everybody, you know, Matthew's hope is not a political organization. We don't belong to a party. Um, I'm independent purposely. Um, I don't share uh, specific uh, political views. I try to look at, what makes sense for the good of the whole? And we definitely have an issue with secure uh, elections. Most of that's because of what's happening outside of our country, not what's happening inside our country. Uh, those have been arguments that have happened for years. And, and not to say it's ever happened, but all the research over decades and decades have shown that, yeah, we had a couple of dead people that voted that shouldn't have. 
Okay, that has happened. But as a general whole, that is never proven to be a real issue. Um, that said, you know, if you're not, in my opinion, if you're not a United States citizen, then you don't get to vote. Mm-hmm. However, if you're a citizen and your rights, for whatever reason, have not been taken away due to, you know, I even question sometimes the felony law at times. I think there's sometimes that some people need to have that taken away. I think the other part of it is for some things, some felonies, you got to sit there and go, you know what? You paid your price. You did your time, whatever your rights are restored. But that can be a whole nother conversation. Right, right, right. But, but, but again, we deal with these people all the time that are trying to get ahead that when, when, for us, when I sit there and I find out what their felony was, I'm going that I didn't know that was a felony, mm-hmm. but nobody ever asked you what your felony is. So anyhow, just yeah. another thought that, no, I agree with you. And I, I feel like that kind of circles back around to the issue with these Florida laws is that people are already in a situation where they're wanting to work. They're trying to look for work and we're putting criminal penalties on people and giving them records where it's just going to make the situation. It's it's becoming an issue that it's just going to keep cycling back around. So it, I think it's just it's adding to the problem. Yeah. Barbie, you mentioned that you don't feel like a lot of the politicians feel that it's a top priority with this homelessness crisis. Scott, how what will happen if people keep ignoring this issue because it doesn't impact them personally down the road? How is this going to impact them? I think that if again, if you just pay attention to what's going on in the world, uh, places that are hit by poverty and homelessness are two different things. But poverty can often lead into homelessness and getting out of homelessness. You don't go from homelessness back into poverty. You've got to either go from homelessness into what I call the real world again, or it's, or you're just going to remain homeless. I think that from a let's just talk about I tell people all the time, I've got donors that I know could care less about homelessness. They kind of have told me so sometimes what they care about is what their downtown looks like. Mm-hmm. OK, and so. When these type of crises develop, and this one has been developing for years, I mean, I was quoted in the paper and I think it was May 19th of, of, of uh, 2019 that our community should be preparing for a homeless tsunami. Mm-hmm. I was basing that on my background in economics. Yeah, I'm a high school dropout, but I was also mm-hmm. a commodities trader and a financial planner. And I was looking at what was happening with property values. I was looking at the market and what have you. And I said, this, this is a storm waiting to happen, not even knowing the pandemic was coming. And of course, that accelerated things to, to, a, to a whole nother level. OK, so that extended it to a whole nother level. And then so what happened is, is that as I watched this explode, I wanted to tell the people around us, Okay, you don't think it's going to bother you. It's not your problem, but it's becoming all of our problems. I mean, even from a taxpayer, you know, you used to be a commercial when I was, I'm I'm much older than you. I could (laughs) probably be your grandfather, (laughs) but um, used to be pay me now or pay me later. Okay, often the investment to be proactive is a lot less expensive to them to be reactive. Mm. And I think that if we don't, if the politicians and leadership of our communities, our state in our country Don't start considering the future. Um, You know, I realize that a lot of people are voting right now based on I'm just trying to figure out how to make it through the last 10 years of my life. Mm -hmm. When I look at something, I look at what am I leaving behind? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so this is why I think it's so important, because economically it's going to strain everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's going to become more and more evident if we ignore it or pretend it's not our problem. And here's the other thing I'll say is, you know, those folks in in the Carolinas that got wiped out from a hurricane. Do you think they ever thought they would be wiped out by a hurricane? And how many of those people, I promise you, this is going to show its ugly head here in the near future, will be homeless, Mm -hmm. not short term, long term, because there was nothing to prepare them for this. Right. And FEMA can only do so much. Right. I think that that's incredibly important to say because I feel like there are so many people, like when we think of the homelessness crisis, we think of one group of people, but we're leaving out the huge group of people in the working and middle classes that are one paycheck away from devastation. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, Personally, we were 
preparing for our fourth child and comfortable. We had a house. We were happy making it through COVID pandemic. And then all of a sudden we have a child that goes through all these health issues and the bill starts stacking up before you even get into the issue of now we have to go out of state for treatment Mm -hmm. because there's none available in Florida. And you know, I hate to work out of state. Exactly. And that became a whole other issue, but we were grateful that so much of our community and our friends and family came together and did a GoFundMe because it helped us be able to do that. And unfortunately, my son passed away after six year or six months, but we were looking towards five years of how do we get electronic wheelchairs and beds and all of these other things. And so we didn't even get into that huge financial burden. And it's still still was huge. Still. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, where we're still having to go through that, you know, six months of treatment and it was $4 million wow. in medical bills. So it, and those are things that you never expect, you never think about. But I also, I, I, I love that you reference the investment into future mm-hmm. because to me, you know, we're looking at homeowners insurance crisis here in Florida and it was already bad. And now we just had two major hurricanes back to back in Florida and what's going to happen now? My family last year, our homeowner's insurance nearly quadrupled in one year. And my house was one year old. So with the increase in property taxes and homeowner's insurance, our mortgage nearly doubled. Mm. That was something that we were not prepared for. We had our mortgage, we had what we expected. And then all of a sudden it's like, no, now you have to pay another more than thousand dollars. But that's why I think things like HUD, these investments for future you know, solutions, long-term solutions, even FEMA, like instead of like, let's come in after the fact and pay this money, let's do some investment and and get to these areas that keep getting hit. And let's try and solve these issues before Mm -hmm. we're paying for people to have their houses rebuilt two, three, four times. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah. We could probably spend (laughs) (laughs) days on that one. Uh, I, I mean, even for me personally, you know, my insurance went up $600 a month. I can assure you my pay didn't go up $600 right. a month. Yeah. And, you know, later on in life, I mean, I'm kind of coming to terms with being in my 60s now. I am better prepared than many others. But even for me, I'm having to look and saying, how, how long can I sustain this without something dramatically changing? And then, of course, two more hurricanes come in. Yeah. Again, you step that back. You know, um, you know, we talked about earlier a little bit about this flood hole thing. You know, that word flood puts a stop to everything when it comes to insurance. And and so these are things that people don't realize. And pe- and I've got homeless people that have been through this that have never recovered from past hurricanes and stuff like that because they were underinsured or they didn't have the flood insurance because they didn't have to have it. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, or they were just trying to make ends meet. Again, you take a situation like Barbie's where you have to make choices. Your choice is always going to go towards your child. But when you made that choice, you had that means something over here had to get put by the wayside and you may or may not recover from it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I say this is this is a problem for everybody, why everyone should be thinking about it, because people that are currently seen to be in a stable position that can change overnight. And here's what's interesting. We don't see people fall out of poverty into homelessness as much as we see people fall out of wealth into homelessness. Okay. And when I say wealth, I'm not talking about the super wealthy, but I'm talking about people that they've made all the right decisions. They've done everything they were supposed to do. They had the 401k, they saved the money, they bought the life insurance, they did all those things. They did it right. And then something took place that was completely out of, well, you only see that on television. Right. That does, that's not going to happen to us. And, and the reality of it is it's, 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 it's not only can, it likely will happen to you at one level or another. It's how you're going to be able to recover from that. Definitely. So let's get into the, um, your favorite your My favorite, favorite things, topic, um, anti-camping law. So Barbie, what was your reaction to the Florida's HB 1365, which went into effect this month and bars municipalities from allowing anyone to sleep in public? Honestly, I was dumbfounded because we are taking a situation that's already bad 
and not really getting the attention it deserves on solutions to help. And we're making it worse. And then to see that it was co-introduced by several of our state legislators here locally, um, you know, Representative Amnesty, Representative Barnaby, uh, Representative Trunow, who is now running for state Senate here in this area. So it, it kind of, you know, what are we doing where we're making it's so much harder on people. Like I said before, where you have, we're giving people criminal records and then how does that affect them continuing on? Well, future employment. Right. Or this has already happened is we have had some of our folks that have been arrested. So they went to jail and they lost their job because there were no call, no show. Yeah. And a lot of the homeless are working uh, many of them are working and they're often working jobs that no one else wants. Right. They're working in nighttime jobs, whatever. They're working odd hours and now they're being arrested because they tried to go to sleep. Mm. And someone said, you know, I mean, uh, Randy Fine, uh, I was in Tallahassee and, and I questioned him directly on this. And he says, well, this will force people into the services they need. And I said, in all due respect, those services do not exist. Mm-hmm. He said, my understanding is you guys do that. I said, well, we do. <laughs> but we only cover about 17 municipalities and we're not funded by you, number one. Yeah. And, and number two, this is a much bigger issue. And his response to me, and I quote, you'll figure it out. Dang. Okay. And I would invite him on. And uh, to, to share that with others, because I won't say anything about somebody I will not say directly to their face. Um, I, I, I don't care if he's is he Republican? I don't, even, I don't know. even know. Is he? I, I don't care if he's Republic, Democrat, whatever. I, I'm saying this is wrong. Yeah, this is wrong. And they they want to make sure when we're in Tallahassee that, that we not called it an anti homeless law. It was anti-camping. And I tell people all the time that when I was homeless, not once did I feel I was camping. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Uh, never felt the same. Uh, never felt like camping to me. And, um, you know, the sad part is, is that we're further disqualifying people to be able to rent a home, buy a home, get a job, what have you. And something that a lot of people haven't thought about. I said to somebody and, and, and Barbie, I don't know you. OK, but I'm going to ask you a question. So <clears throat> if I woke you up every night about two, three o'clock in the morning, how, how do you feel you might react? Yeah, not good. <laughs> not, not good. And and how do you feel your body would react night after night of dealing with that, not getting a full night's rest? Well, as a woman who had four children in five years, I know. <laughs> well, you're just nuts. Fortunately, how exactly that feels. And, but, it, uh, but I had a roof over my head and mm. I had the security of a home and, you know, it's exhausting, which is part of the point. But here's what I said to somebody the other day. I said, now take that same person in their vet that has PTSD. Mm -hmm. They're woken up. What do you think they're going to come up Mm. doing? They're going to come up swinging. Now they've assaulted a police officer. Mm. Do you think that person who served our country had any intention of assaulting a police officer? Right. No. And now he has that on his record. Instead of this person has a mental illness, this person has uh, uh, something that needs to be dealt with. And and we need to start investing into these things rather. What I say all the time is we spend most of our money hiding the homeless rather than helping them. Right. We spend most of our money treating symptoms rather than causes. And I've always compared it to if you and I were sitting here and – uh, you, you're sniffling and I offered you a tissue and think of those tissues, a hundred dollar bills. Right. And, and, uh, at some point I need to sit there and go, well, does Barbie have a cold? Could it be allergies? Maybe she has a cocaine habit. Like <laughs> I, I did. Right. Okay. She does not have a cocaine habit. Okay. <laughs> um, but the point being is you got to peel the onion back and look at the cause and mm-hmm. treat that because just continuously handing you tissues mm-hmm. fix nothing. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how we address most things when it comes to a lot of issues. But in particular, we're talking about homelessness today. Well, but what would happen is in, instead of investing in hiding a problem, we invested in the people. And what will those people then turn around and do? Mm-hmm. Because to me, it's it's not throwing money away. It's investing in the people that will then turn around 
and invest right back into their communities Mm -hmm. through taxes, through things like that. They're investing in the economy. It's only going to help us. It only hurts us. If you want to just think of it in money terms, it's only going to hurt us in the long run. If we're, you know, last year we added 20, 20% to our homelessness here in Florida, 22% of them more families. So, so what are we doing where we're just going to keep adding to this problem. We're going to get to a point where we can't even address it with the money we have, Mm -hmm. but we have to look at it as an investment in the people because they want to help. They want to turn around and they want to pay their share. They want to be able to live happy, healthy, and secure lives. Let's let them do it. So instead of hiding the problem, let's help it. Mm -hmm. And I think it only helps ourselves. Go Barry should certainly know that people choose to be homeless. I know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, and look, I tell people all the time, I've never met anybody in all my life at being homeless and in serving the homeless now the last 20 some years, um, never met one person that chose to be homeless. I have met people who have chosen to remain homeless because we've made it so hard yeah. and they've just given up. Mm-hmm. And most of us in our lifetime has have given up on something. Yeah. And what's the difference? You know, and so, you know, you, you just gave out some pretty staggering numbers to 20 percent. That is what we believe we know. Yeah. Now, having done the point in time count for years now, I can tell you the point in time count that HUD sponsors that we do every year. It's a census of homeless people. Um, that counts way off because you just can't. Account. People are moving. Um, you know, a number of years ago, it wasn't uh, it wasn't considered homeless if you lived in a hotel that would, now that's considered uh, stable housing. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you been to some of these hotels? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's no water. There's no power. There's there. It's pretty. It's sometimes you're better off in the woods. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but the point being is that that that's just the number we're admitting to that we understand. You said 22 percent more families. Yeah. 22% increase in families from 2022 to 2023. That That is like, to me, leaving your house in the morning, coming back that night, you have the same size house, you have the same budget, but now you have to figure out all these, you have 22% more people in your house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How, how do you do that? Mm-hmm. And I think if you're not proactive, mm-hmm. uh, eventually that will swallow up. And it will not only swallow up uh, independent wealth, it will swallow up our nation's wealth, mm-hmm. yeah. our, our, the community that we enjoy, the wealth that we enjoy in our community of having nice stuff. Yeah. I always, I always compare it to people in my own situation because they look at me and they're like, Oh, you have a, a, a nice house. You have a car, you have a healthy, happy family. And I'm like, yes, but I also came into a situation where we were one, we're a one income household and I would not have been able to work if my son was still you know, living, I would be a 24 hour caregiver. Right. right. Um, I always compare what he had metachromatic leukodystrophy to a two year old being diagnosed with ALS and dementia. Mm -hmm. So it's like a progressive degenerative disorder and needs 24 hour care. So I wouldn't have been able to work. And what would then happen if my husband lost his job? Mm -hmm. What would happen to our family? And a lot of people, it's like, oh, well, you save money for those, (laughs) those rainy days. But at some point you can't save if you know, we're one national crisis away from a huge, huge issue. So there's all these circumstances that we can't control, but, um, and how much were they paying you to be that caregiver? None. Oh, zero. Okay. Zero. And and I see that's, and that's just the point I want to make is too. she had more than a full-time job, uh, that paid nothing. In fact, every moment as sad as this is that that child lived cost more money Mm -hmm. that wasn't coming from anywhere. Yeah. HB 1365 went into effect this month. Are either of you aware of any municipalities that have actually taken action towards providing the camps that the bill calls for? No. And I think the biggest problem is because it doesn't call for any mechanism to fund Mm -hmm. any of that. Um, I also think that we've maybe seen it, even though it's in effect, not go into effect because we've had these back-to-back major hurricanes and a lot of attention elsewhere, but it's only a matter of time, unfortunately. But yeah, if we don't fund these things, where is it? How are we going to do it? Right. You know, I find what interesting too, is that in in this particular uh, building, these encampments that are supposed to go into place, the idea behind it is, uh, again, it got it off the state's back. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, because the state put it in demand, mandated it, and then didn't fund it, and then it dumped onto the counties and the cities who are saying they don't have money. But here's the other problem: is is this law would require local municipalities to come together on a plan to fund it together on agreed upon piece of property the county would own and in a particular area. Now, each of these encampments are supposed to have mental health, showers, a litany of things that we do at Matthew's Hope, but they, as I understand it, can only stay in one spot for one year. Common sense. If you've ever built anything from a model car on up as a child, the length of time it would just take to get everything approved and the infrastructure built would be more than the year it would actually be allowed to be in existence. Yeah. And for some reason people went, okay, this is a good idea. I, they put a very pretty bow on a very ugly bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a way to cover up the intention. But again, it's, it, it's never going to come to fruition if there's no funding for it. Which leaves the only option is, Incarceration. Exactly. Okay. And what's um, incarceration going to do? But <clears throat> overload our even... jails and mm-hmm. penitentiaries. Why don't they take that money that they're incarcerating with and do it, put it into good? Like, I don't understand why it's so hard for them to realize that where they would rather just, oh, throw them in jail and let's spend. What, 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 we talked about this in a previous episode. It was like 50000 a it, year. Yeah, well, uh, 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 Nicole Wilson, mm-hmm. who is the Orange County Commissioner for this area of West Orange County, uh, Nicole has has tried a lot of different things to get in front of people. But one of the things that she stated and one of the researches that she did was it, it was shown that to incarcerate a homeless person runs forty five to $55,000 per year per individual. And she looked at me and she said, Scott, what could you do with that kind of money? Mm. Uh, Well, first off, I mean, we will never solve the problem, but I'd make one big bet in it for that kind of money. But, you know, the the other it was interesting. I'll just share with you that in in Coco, where our other campus is based, um, we're we're preparing to build transitional housing there. It took us 18 months to get through the process just to get to the point of being able to go to permitting for a place that wanted us there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now you throw in that NIMBY, not in my backyard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Again, there's so much that's wrong with this. That's right. Barbie, if you're elected, what actions would you like to take to help address our area's homeless crisis? Well, I will cut in really quick. And this is not something I would be able to do in the federal government, but I do think that it's something locally that we have to address. Um, We have this tourism tax And I have here in Orange County, the tourist development tax in 2022, 2023 year was $359 million. And it goes to fund Visit Orlando and it goes to fund our Kia Center and the Dr. Phillips Center and uh, the Convention Center and all of the Camping World. So to me, it's we have to use this incredible amount of money to not circle back around and help the things that are going to be helping themselves anyways Mm -hmm. and help the people that are local here that are being affected by tourism, by the increase in housing costs, by all of these uh, investment corporations or businesses coming in and buying up properties and and driving up the prices because of the tourism that we have Mm -hmm. here. We don't have to spend $359 million a year to get people to come to Orlando. They're coming to Orlando. I was just going to say that. I'm pretty confident saying if we cut that budget to zero, they're coming. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Disney has more than built its reputation. Universal has built its reputation. SeaWorld, and I can go on. Right. Everybody knows what we have here. Uh, it's not to say we don't do any type of advertising. At the same time, the reality of it is if you cut that budget by 90%, I'd be willing to bet. Who's in charge of that budget? I want to know. Whoever's in charge of that budget, I want to invite you on to our podcast here so you can explain the difference. And I'm willing to bet you everything that if you cut that by 90%, invest it into the community as opposed to mm-hmm. trying to get tourists that are already going to come here to come here, 
Okay, because Disney, my understanding is Disney and nothing against Disney. It has nothing to do with them. Disney, Carnival, uh, Celebrity, all those things that are coming out of here all do their own advertising. Correct. They do. Yeah. So pretty much I think it's fair to say they're probably going to come. God, this gets me fired up because, <laughs> well, it's kind of like when I saw, you know, we're going to beautify Lake Eola again. How many times in my lifetime are we going to beautify Lake Eola? You want to beautify it. Well, first off, you set up services, and you don't have people sleeping in your park. Right. Uh, but that's that's uh, the smarter people than me are in government. So I. Well, I do agree that some of that money needs to go to the attractions or to our sure. local culture that doesn't get the huge audiences and visitors. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are ways that it can go to help, but we also have to be investing in ourselves because we're the ones that are going to make the, it's, it's, it's our home. We've chosen right. to live here, not just visit and then, and leave. So what would happen is if we took some of these areas where we have hotels and motels that have sat vacant or that have kind of become run down and we change those in into affordable housing and low and it's going to be better than what's there. Mm -hmm. And the investment is so much smaller than what we're investing in websites for people to come to Orlando. Um, Again, not to completely, you know, no. And I, and I want to (laughs) say this in fairness to Barbie, that was my rant, not hers. Um, you know, we do need to invest right. in, in those things and bring people and make sure we have the infrastructure in place and what have you. It's, it's just when you bring that up, you think of the the amount of money that's spent. Like I said, they're, they're going to come. Yeah. They're going to come. And, and I do think there are smaller uh, uh, things in our community through, you know, throughout Florida that if people were aware of. Uh, tourists would go there too. Yeah, well, absolutely. And and that's and, and they don't the have the finances local, to sit there right. and say come to Homosassa Springs or yeah. you know some of the other uh, And this is just the tourism tax. This yeah. is not any other type of, you know, that we pay here as as residents to fund our government or fund the county or the cities or anything like that. So this is just extra money. Um but yeah, I, I feel like going back to what we've said before, we have to invest in the people that are here. And the people that are only going to reinvest back into the area. And well, we've had, you've had several guests. We've had them on the podcast where they found themselves, you know, on the streets. But then they were guests of Home, or Matthew's Hope. And they became part of everything again, working at local shops. Well, a lot of these folks also. others. A lot of these folks that we serve are working at our amusement parks. Mm-hmm. They're working at the jobs that a lot of people as servers, they're working mm-hmm. as the lawn care workers, they're yep. working, they're working a lot of jobs that nobody else really wants when it gets right down to it. I mean, let's be honest, it, they just don't want the job. Um, and but what's happening is, is that when you make it so expensive to even go to work, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I know that I think it's Disney right now investing and I think Universal might be doing it too, investing in some housing close by for, for their employees, Mm -hmm. which, which I think is pretty brilliant in a lot of ways. Um, but the same time that we make it so expensive in an area to be, and yet you want that person to serve you, but if they've got to drive an hour out to find someplace affordable, how often are they going to want to come in? Mm -hmm. And and it's, 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 again, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. If we don't address it, uh, you want to think of the worst, the worst will happen if we, Just ignore it. Definitely. But I will, I mean, I, we kind of went off on like, but I was going to say like, uh, you know, the local issue that I wouldn't as a member of Congress would not have any effect on, but to me personally, what would I do to address it? I I think that we do have to look at HUD funding, like we said, and make sure, and I think this is across the board at the federal government, we need to make sure that the money that we're putting out there is actually going to help the situations that it's being put towards and not just the appearance of it. Uh, I or think, keep funding what we've always funded because we've always done it. Right. Mm-hmm. There has to be better oversight. And unfortunately, I think that we've gotten away from a lot of that because we're too focused on issues with between people and between parties and, yeah. and not the issues that are really affecting people. And, and to me, that's, you know, as somebody who has gone through an eviction as somebody who has my parents were teenage parents. So I know what it's like to be financially strained. 
that, um, you know, our childcare costs were more than our mortgage costs. So these are things that I know. And, and I feel like I want to address these things. I don't want to address infighting. I don't want to address like, Oh, what the appearance of things is because I, I, I've personally felt it. And I've personally experienced these things, even though I've still been very blessed and privileged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of interesting to consider yourself blessed and privileged with, with everything that you personally been through and what, um, and, and different people have been through. Mm-hmm. Cause sometimes I think we do have to look at what, how blessed and privileged we often are, but recognize the fact that how easy it can go back to the way it was mm-hmm. or worse and, and how, how yeah. hard that fall can be. Yeah. Uh, okay. if, if you're not paying attention. Yeah. I think that that's it's kind of off subject, but that's something that people say to me all the time. But, you know, I had a situation where, My son was diagnosed through the genetic testing. And once it came back and we got this fatal diagnosis, I had three other children Mm -hmm. that we had to then test and wait to hear, are they also going to get diagnosed with the same thing? So there was that waiting period of, is this horrible situation just going to become four times worse? Am I going to lose all my children? Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it gets to the point where you've suffered through a lot and you, you learn to see the kind of sunshine and rainbows and situations. But, um, you know, thankfully all three of my children came back and they're all carriers. Like my husband and I were never knew. Um, but it almost seems like you're lucky in a a certain way that you only had one child because there's so many other families that, that have lost all of their children. Mm -hmm. Strange place to be. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Barbie, so much for being here. I really love your vulnerability and sharing your heart. And you really do have a heart for the people, which we need more of that. So I appreciate you coming on. And thank you, Scott, as well. I learn from you every day. (laughs) Thank you guys for listening and watching. Please like, subscribe, share so we can get this message out to everybody. And keep an eye on our Facebook pages and stuff. I mean, the needs are daily. And we try to update them every few days as far as what our most specific needs are. You know, some people have said that that we're too picky. Mm-hmm. It's really having an understanding of doing this long enough of what we actually need and and what just a lot of times what people do in, in the and they do the wrong thing for the right reason. And it becomes very costly for us. And so we try to share exactly what we need. So do do follow us on Facebook. And and uh, if you got topics that you want to see us tackle here on on uh, on this podcast, uh, throw it out there. There's no question that's too hard for us. Sometimes we might have an, an answer you like. <laughs> Sometimes we might not have an answer at all. But I think that the only way you get to those answers is that you you are willing to ask the hard questions and and sit there and start peeling the onion back. Yeah. And so that's what our goal is with this podcast. And, and before you close, I'm just going to put that open invitation out to all those running for office and all those currently in office. Um, you can see there's no aha moments here. Uh, there's times we agree and we disagree. But I think the most important thing is we owe it to the general public mm-hmm. to have them understand exactly what we think, how we feel, what we think we're going to do. And, and then be accountable to that um, before we ask for your vote. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and that's even when we're asking, I'm not asking for your vote. I'm not running anything. <laughs> but your vote every day is whether you choose to put that that twenty dollars in an envelope uh, or stop by the office or 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 do a donation to us. That's the vote. That's your vote of confidence that we're doing in the right way. So we want to hear. We want to hear and we want to know. So. Thanks, Tracy, again. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Barbie. Thank Thank you. you for listening.